at the time, there was a little bit of a sort of rumblings in the medical world around sort of this idea of big data and how it applies to like patient data and like enormous blood test results that we have going back like decades and how to get insights from that. And because I was sort of interested in technology, I was like, oh, maybe this could be an angle that I kind of talk about. Thankfully, they never asked me any questions about it because I really wasn't prepared. But well, you yeah. didn't do so bad. You got it <laughs> anyway. But um, but the but it was around that time. It was around 2011. I was writing the book Big Data. 2012, it came out, so it's about a decade old. It's still not there, which is sort of interesting. The 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 intellectual underpinnings of using data in society to improve society is sort of understood. But to actually make social change takes a long time, takes decades. In the case of medicine, we're still not using information. I mean, we use it in a pointillist way, like a, an internist will walk by the, the bedside of a person in the hospital, would pick up a clipboard or the digital equivalent of it, um, and will look at the, at the numbers and make a decision on it. And that's ridiculous and obscene, because really what you want to do is to have every single person who's had that exact same condition and meets the same criteria of the patient going back a decade, and you would then have a sort of a co-pilot, if you will, as the term that we now use in terms of using AI to support human beings, would to then make its own estimation. And you might want to blind the two. And see if the two decisions in terms of the next therapy and next, you know, diagnostic uh, is the same mm. in which you're confirming it. Or then to, if you have a difference, add a third person, a minority report, if you will, a third person to make a decision on it, to vote in one direction or the other. And then to use the feedback of what happened. Was it the right diagnostic or not? And of course, it's never white or black. So you, so it's, it's, a, it's a spectrum of yeah. right-ish or wrong-ish. What, what are the alternatives? You don't know the counterfactual. And then to feed that back in to the next person. Google does this for search. So if, you're, if everyone starts clicking on the second search result for the same search term, or better yet, if everyone's clicking on the eighth search result for a given search term, Google, the algorithm knows to move it up to the first or second place because it's clearly the most popular. Each click is a vote. So why don't we do that in healthcare? It's crazy. Mm. And again, it's obscene because all it takes is the will and a bit of dosh, and we improve patient outcomes and we improve society, and we lower our costs. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's, there's so much here where, um, like, whenever anyone I know, well, for me as well, whenever we start working in medicine and we see the amount of data that is available and then see the fact that it's all, you know, in the UK, some of it is still in pen and paper system, some of it you have to use four different apps to access, like, your blood tests and then the sort of the vital signs of the patient and another one for your scans and another one for the drug stuff. And it's like, there are very few systems that integrate all the things. And the ones that do, like I, I was working in Cambridge at Addenbrooke's Hospital that did integrate all the things. And it was incredible. I could run my whole night shift from like the cafe Burger King downstairs, because they always have Burger Kings in hospital for some reason. And just like <laughs> on the iPad, because they had an iPad app, it was, you know, someone ring me about a patient, I'd be able to immediately see all the things. It still wasn't co piloty in that it wasn't telling me what to do next. But even just the basics of just having all the information in one place was a really good starting point. Um, yeah. Well, we might not, for, keep in mind, we might not want it to be a full co-pilot system, particularly for you at the outset of your career. We wanted you to make decisions. In mm -hmm. fact, we sort of sadly want you to make mistakes because if you make mistakes when you're young, you probably won't when you're old. What we would like to do is maybe validate your decision or have you reconsider your decision, right? So if the you know, if the if you think that this person has gallstones and in fact it turns out it's septus, right? And anyone could see it a, a mile away and your supervisor would, but it's four in the morning, right? We want the AI system and the, or in this case the big data system to simply prod you and say, have you considered septus? Right. And and we just say, ah oh, yeah, maybe, maybe that's right. And mm -hmm. you can reconsider. Um, it might want to tell you it's confidence, its, de its, its degree of confidence in its diagnosis, in which it says that actually we think it's different, but it's really only with a 60% likelihood or degree of confidence in this instance, where you're quite sure that it's actually not this for this other intervening reason. Uh, the toxicity of the patient would kill him if you were to give that particular drug, sure. for example. Um, those are the ways in which we would use data effectively, but it requires two things. One, probably a regulatory change. We need to sort of loosen privacy rules in certain wise ways that are still governed under very strict law, but loosened for the, this social goal. Uh, privacy law never presumed a world of statistics and presumed commercial rapaciousness. It didn't really, it doesn't really accept the idea that with a large body, the big data 
message, which is, or if you will, lead motif. With a large body of data, you can do things that you inherently can't do with a smaller amount of it. It's not about the point list sliver of information, but the agglomeration of a large body of data, asking new questions, answering them in more um, deeper and more accurate ways than we ever could have, and granular ways than we ever could imagine. That's the first. The bigger problem is a, is a change of mindset. Mm. We need, if you will, a data duty of care mindset, and that is to say we can't accept a world in which um, we're going to make human decisions and we're going to try to validate those decisions with a smidgen of information that confirms what we think we're looking at. We, we reframe it. We inverse the, the, reverse the process, if you will, and say that it's not a nice to have, it's a thou must have. You have a legal and moral responsibility to apply data to questions that we can use the data to help us answer. Mm. And if you don't, you're negligent and on the hawk. So it's not like a doctor says, um, here's my decision and here's how I justified it with the data, but it says, this, here's my decision, and if I didn't use data to confirm it and to validate it, I have not performed my duty of care to my patient, and I go to jail, or I'm, I'm on, for li on the hawk mm. for liability. If we had a world like that, you would never have an environment in which patients go in and hope the best for whoever is making a bleary-eyed decision at four in the morning, yep. because you're always going to have this sort of support mechanism of... Every single data point the NHS has collected over the last decade for every patient that looks like mine. Hey friends, thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this clip, then click here for the full unedited episode. And if you like that, then do please consider subscribing to the channel. It means a lot. Thank you so much and have a great day.